Fear Not America, this is Pastor Elia Cook here at Jackson Street Baptist Church here in Scranton, Pennsylvania, to remind you yet again, God is faithful. He is with us. He is with us to the very end. He cares about you. He loves you. He died on the cross for your sins. He's going to provide for you and bring you through whatever it is you're going through. Hey, we've been talking about growing as Christians. You know, when you're come to faith in Christ and you're trusting and believing that he died on the cross for your sins, you're a baby. And God wants to stretch you and to grow you and to mature you so that he can use you. He wants to give you gifts, talents, and abilities, and he's got a mission for you. That's why we're here. Otherwise, we might as well just go straight to heaven. He's left us here for a reason, for a purpose. Are you fulfilling your purpose, dear Christian? If you're not, get into the word receive from the Lord direction and guidance. That's what it is all about. Today, we're taking a look at Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. Uh, if you are joining us for the first time today, you can go back and check on previous messages and get up to speed because you're jumping into the middle of a <clears throat> difficult passage and I just encourage you to go back and take a look at some of the others. It will make sense to you uh, better if you do. First Corinthians, uh, Revelation chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Lord, help us to understand and apply your word to our lives this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The dragon, which we learned is Satan himself, stood on the shore of the sea the sea, the ocean. What does the sea stand for? Some people believe it stands for the political process. Uh, others believe in other things. Anyway, and I saw a beast come out of the sea. Okay, so there's this ruler, this entity that has power and might. It had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its horns and on each head a blasphemous name. A lot is read into this. This is very similar to other beasts uh, that Daniel saw in the Old Testament, and uh, there's correlation there. Certainly John was familiar with the prophecies of, of Daniel and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and others in the Old Testament and brought a lot of the, their imagery perhaps with him, but he's seeing a revelation. He's not remembering Old Testament passages and writing about them. He is given a revelation from Jesus and he's writing what he is seeing as best as he can, describing it to us, things that are impossible to describe. And it is not a coincidence that there are similarities between this beast and the statue or other entities in the Old Testament because they're all from God and this time, instead of there being ten toes, there are ten horns, etc. And what each one means, probably different rulers that come up, so on and so forth. Uh, people try to understand in the course of human events when these kings have rose. Uh, it seems to indicate that Satan is calling forth in the tribulation a beast who's going to come. And there are ten rulers ruling with this beast um, and they have blasphemous names on each of them. The beast I saw resembled a leopard but had the feet like those of a bear and the mouth of that of a lion. And the dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. This is the Antichrist people. Uh, what is Antichrist? You have God the Father and his son, Christ, you have Lord Satan and his son, the Antichrist. You see, whatever God does, Satan likes to mimic. He likes to pretend that he is God. We have the Holy Bible. There's a Satanic Bible. God has sent forth his son into the world. So has Lucifer sent his son into the world, or at least a spirit of his war against God. 
we call the Antichrist. The Antichrist is the spirit of Antichrist. It's not necessarily one entity, one person who does the bidding of Satan. It's probably many throughout the course of history. We've seen the spirit of Antichrist come upon different ones who proclaim themselves God and sit on the throne of the temple um, and so on and so forth. Uh, Hitler was thought to be an Antichrist. And, you know, in each generation, it seems that there is one who embodies Satan himself. And that is the spirit of Antichrist, which is in every age and is close to every generation. And in the tribulation, and this is what we're studying in Revelation, we're studying the tribulation, the last seven years of humanity's history. The rapture has already happened. Christians are taken up. They're removed from this. And then these things happen. <clears throat> so the Antichrist or a Antichrist might be there before uh, the tribulation starts. But during the tribulation, one is called forth from the sea. And we're jumping around perhaps in time. You know, we've already seen the first half of the tribulation. We started to see some of the second half and he jumps back to the beginning of the tribulation to uh, the vision uh, that's shown to John perhaps is rolled back and we go back for the second verse to see how the Antichrist or the beast comes to power. Verse 2, the beast I saw resembled a leopard but had the feet of those of a bear and the mouth of that of a lion and the dragon gave to the beast its power, its throne and its great authority. One of its heads uh, was the of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound but the fatal wound had been healed. Now, Jesus was crucified, but he rose from the dead. And so this Antichrist, Satan's mimicking the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord in his Antichrist. It seems to have been fatally wounded and seems to have been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast because it came back to life. All right. And the world is devoid of Christians. So they're looking for a new religion because Christianity has been removed. They're looking for new leaders because who knows how many people are taken in the rapture. And so they need new leadership and they're looking for a leader to follow. They are going through quite the ordeal and they will do what this, this man promises, this one, this beast promises because there is great hope for them in him. At least they think there is. Of course, that hope is propped up, backed up by Satan, and he's trying to destroy mankind and take them to hell with him. Verse 4, people worship the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worship the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? Is this a literal beast? Probably not. It's probably an organization, it's probably an individual, it's probably an entity based in human origin. And Satan is empowering this beast. Verse 5, the beast was given a mouth to utter great, to utter proud words of blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. Okay, that's three and a half years. That's half the tribulation. This is probably the first half of the tribulation from my perspective. Um, ask the Holy Spirit to tell you what it means. This stuff gets hard. The first half of the tribulation, a beast comes from the sea, the sea of, oh, what would you call this sea? The abyss, uh, that which Satan hides and holds uh, evil. That's what I'm thinking the sea is, and it's the first half of the tribulation. In verse 6, it opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people, Israel. You know that for the first half, 
this Antichrist probably has a treaty with God's people, the holy people of God. And they're allowed to build their temple, but in the middle, towards the end of this reign, the first three and a half years, three and a half years, he wages war. He breaks the treaty with God's people and um, wages war against them. And uh, it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Verse 8, all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all those whose names have not, have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Everyone seems to be following after the beast. Whatever he does turns to gold. Whatever he does prospers. He brings peace during that first half of the tribulation. He, he brings humanity together and they solve problems in the crisis. And there's natural disasters. There's things happening that are not good. And Satan enables him to succeed and bring in a false hope to people who are hopeless. Verse 9, whoever has ears, let them hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. There are some who will come to Christ during the seven-year tribulation. The rapture, the raptured Christians are already left, but some who come to Christ after the rapture who will have to live those entire seven years are going to be pressed into servitude, go into captivity, they'll be killed and martyred for their faith. And John is reminding, or Jesus is reminding people, that we must patiently endure um, and be faithful to make it through. That's the first half of the tribulation, uh, the beast that comes forth. Uh, the, let's just generally look at that and understand that the spirit of Antichrist and Satan himself is at work to set up rulers and kingdoms and principles and organizations just as God has done from the creation of the world, when God turns his back on the world and removes his church from the world, Satan finally has free reign. Before the rapture, before the tribulation, God was in control and he raised up uh, leaders and kings in the world to promote justice and mercy and to be his, his hand, as it were, to discipline the people and the nations. So it will be in this period called the tribulation where Satan will take on that role and he will raise up and perhaps a one world government and this Antichrist will rule the world. Um, he appears to die and he's raised back and people are worshiping him. Now we're going to talk about it tomorrow for there is a second beast, the second half of the tribulation that rises up and you'll see what happens tomorrow with that. This spirit of Antichrist is what I would like to pray against. It's the same spirit that prompts your neighbor to ridicule you or make fun of you because of your faith or your co-workers to make fun of you because of your faith. It's, it's the spirit that inspires the evil and wickedness that abounds in some of our communities across America and around the world. It is the spirit of Antichrist that leads men astray to this day and will in end times as well. We need to be able to recognize the hand of Satan, the work of Satan in the hearts of men. Just as God works in the hearts and minds of men, so doesn't Satan. It's a war for our souls, people. And that's why we're in God's word today, studying it and trying to understand it and apply it to our lives. How do we apply this passage? To take heed that Satan is alive and well in the planet Earth, and the spirit of Antichrist is making war against you, God's saint. Well, let's pray that we would be fully clothed in the armor of God, Ephesians chapter 6. You might want to read that this evening when your head hits the pillow. Great little passage about how we can be fully clothed in an armor that will protect us. Uh, let's pray.
Heavenly Father, it is good to be able to come before you and to know that you hear our prayers. Thank you for your salvation, for Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. Thank you for shielding us and, and putting a hedge of protection around us and watching over us and caring for us, sending your angels to give charge over our protection. Uh, for all this, Father, we give you thanks. We know that there is evil out there. We know that there's an entity called the devil and his demons. We know that the spirit of Antichrist is out there. And many are susceptible to them because they don't have a relationship to you like we do. Father, we pray that you would extend our hedge of protection to include our families, uh, those people that we work with, our friends, that they would, they would be included in a blessing that as our cup runneth over, it would spill out and over onto them as well. Now, they're not going to be saved because of our faith, but they will perhaps be blessed and protected because of us. We pray that our witness would be so effective, Father, that they would come to know the good news of the gospel and believe that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, that they would repent and that it would have a cascading effect upon many peoples across our community, across our land, around the world, Father, please. Won't you send your spirit in a mighty way in these end times as we approach this seven-year tribulation, a final opportunity for man to repent. Father, we understand that we'll be taken from this world and the spirit of Antichrist will rise up and, and reign and rule in, in this place, Father, unlike ever before. And we pray against that spirit in this age and the next, Father. We know that you will triumph and we look forward to the day when it will all be over and finally done. Until then, Father, save our, our relatives, our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers, and those that we interact with on a daily basis. And use us, Lord, use us somehow in some strange way to plant seeds, to encourage faith in each one. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I pray the Lord's blessing upon you today that God would give you those opportunities and that you would be careful, that you would see, uh, take the blinders off and understand the spirit of Antichrist and the work of the evil one in your community and work against it. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Fear not, America. We'll see you tomorrow.